quarrelsome campaigns, voter rebellion and a threat to our postponement of polls lingers. Tonight we take a broad look at the events leading up to next week's election and we're addressing voter concerns. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anacol. Leader of Yoruba's social political organization, Afeni Ferry Pa Ayo Adebanjo, recently noted that the forthcoming elections in Nigeria should not be seen as an ordinary poll. The respected Yoruba leader urged the electorate to take the ballot seriously because it holds the key to Nigeria's future. Nigerians have also expressed worries that the electioneering uh, by the political parties and their candidates have not dwelt on the critical issues militating against the social well-being of the citizens. On top of that, insecurity tops concerns of citizens as abductions, mass killings and terrorism makes life chaotic and unpredictable in the country. Well, joining us to discuss the state of the nation and concerns tonight is Wemimo Adeoni. She is a media strategy and communications expert, Achike Chude, who is a public affairs analyst, and Dr. Ndu Mokolo, who is a partner and chief executive next year SPD. Thank you so much, Dr. Ndu, for joining us. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Great. Let's start with you. Um, earlier today, you and I had had a conversation similar uh, to this. But um, let's start with the fact that there's been a lot of mudslinging. I mean, this is not something that is new to us in the Nigerian political space. Uh, but this time around, there's not just mudslinging, but a lot of quarrelsome campaigning. And we've seen inter-party divisions and also um, across the different political parties. Uh, how, how would you describe um, the difference between um, other elections and this election cycle? Okay, I think there are a couple of things that seems new, but not, not really new, but we're just seeing them imagine. First, this is the first time you're going to have, or the first time who is likely to be a Nigerian president is not a former president, a former military head of, head of state, or rather, they say it this way. This might be the first time you have non-military head of state being in the ballot. That's one. Two, the emergence of social media has been able to expand the space. So, so yes, it was there in 2019, but it's a bit different. Maybe because of entrance of a lot of young people. That's two. Secondly, unlike 2019 or 2015, when you had what I could seemingly say to be a north-south um, contestation. This time around is like as if we are having a three horse race that is within the three major ethnic groups in Nigeria. So if you want to say it that way. So there are a lot of emerging social political issues. And more importantly is now you equally have a leader, as in President Mohamed Buhari, who is a leader who is not going for re-election. So meaning that he has no dog in the in the fight. But the, the thing that looks a bit, I don't want to say confusing, but interesting is that you have a president who seems a bit withdrawn from his party, who wants to if I could say, take a go a, a little leave from President Jonathan and allow the election to to flow the way it should flow in terms of free and fair election. So you could see members of his party thinking, see, we are here, we are the ruling party, and we, we can't even establish power of incumbency. So these are a couple of things we can see. But if we if we go on the other flip side. Is the disturbing side, which is the the social political issue, especially the security issues we are seeing across all the nooks and crannies of the country. I think that's one other one that 
but that's everybody. In addition to that, is is the economy that is not doing well, and then the redesigning of the naira that seems to have, you know, put everything in in different perspective. So, uh, there are quest a lot of questions have been asked, but the most important thing is that we still believe that um, come twenty fifth of February we are going to have an election. Let's look at the insecurity first things first. Um, we saw the lynching of the, uh, the young lady, Deborah, that led to her death um, somewhere in the north. Um, there was also some form of lynching that happened here in Lagos, which led to the Lagos state government putting an end to, you know, the Okada riders and, um, you know, pushing them into um, the smaller streets in Lagos. And we've seen several other cases. We, we saw the issue of flooding. Uh, a certain candidate decided that she was going to stop, you know, campaigning so that she could go visit. Um, and, and all of those things, people read, you know, meaning into it one way or the other. Um, these things, as opposed to speaking to them, speaking on the issues, it became a campaign tool in the hands of these politicians. For example, um, Atiku got flack for posting and deleting a tweet um, that was condemning the killing of uh, Deborah. Uh, something that, you know, if pe people are still asking Atiku about it till today, and he says, oh, well, I didn't sanction the tweets. And then the question is, where's the other tweets that you sanctioned? Why did he not come out? On the, on the other hand, uh, there have been the issue of um, Muslim, Muslim ticket, where people have said religion has become the order of the day, should not necessarily be um, what should be captured in this election. So let's start with the insecurity part. People continued campaigning as business as usual while people were being kidnapped, um, people were being killed, people were being bombed. I'd like to remind you, Dr. Wokolo, about the unknown aircraft that shot down people uh, in Nasarawa State, and of course, uh, I, I think in um, I think in um, Niger State, if I'm not mistaken, all of these things has happened, and Nigerians were hoping to hear something very definite from all of the front runners, but nothing was said. How well do you think that the politicians, especially the, the presidential candidates, have handled the issue of insecurity or addressed it in any way? So, I'll, I'll first try to say that, of course, we understand that. Governance is an issue for us. So security or provision of security is part of is part and parcel of governance. So you most times you it becomes very difficult to single it out and make it be a standalone indices to to judge um, a regime or to judge a government. Now the Nigerian state um, for some time now is battling, you know. A, Insecurity, you know, ranging from farmer header conflict to the banditry to terrorism, to secession agitation, to courtism, to marine piracy, to communal conflict. There are so many, many of them. So, um, you, so if you look at them holistically, it's a governance issue. It didn't start today. It didn't even start if white President Buhari was uh, when he took office. It didn't even start when President um, Obasanjo was there. So, you know, these things were snowboarding from one, one conflict to the other. As you fail to resolve one, it, it kind of morphs into another, so to where we are today. So, now the question to, to whoever becomes Nigerian president, how do we start dealing with all of them? If you, if you listen to the campaign of each of them, if you, you try to single each campaign, that of P2B, that of um, um, Atika Bobaka, that of um, Wangpasu, that of um, um, uh, Tinibu, and listening to them, you can see how each person tried to package and present how he's going to solve Nigerian problem. So it's now, it's now, uh, you know, for the uh, electorates to listen to each campaign message, maybe manifesto, maybe whatever is uh, their talking points, and see, are they addressing? those security concerns that I think will make meaning to me. So it becomes very difficult to, to try to put all of them holistically and judge them with you know, a kind of a one, one, one cap fit all. Each person has his own message 
the how do I want to solve it? So P2B is talk, talking about I'm, I'm going to security is my major issue. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to resolve it. I'm going to do that. Atiku has said what he wants to do. So is Sinibu, so is Wanka. So, so it's not for the electorate to say, I think this messaging, you know, makes meaning to me. I think he is able to deal with it. So there are many indices you need to consider while trying to see whose messaging makes meaning to you. I, I think that's 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 my the best way to try to analyze the messaging of each of the presidential or the, the four uh, front runners okay. in, in this presidential election. Okay, Wemima Adoni and uh, Chike Chude, I uh, have just joined us. I'm going to start with Wemima. Wemima, uh, just as I, I asked the doctor at the beginning, like I said, the, the, this, this elections have experienced the most quarrelsome campaigns of all times. I mean, we've seen, and it's not just for the frontline runners, even the people that work with them, the people who seem to be their uh, spokesperson, we've seen a lot more mudslinging um, than we've ever seen before. What do you think is, resp I mean, many, many have also said this is one of the most keenly, this might have to be the most keenly contested election of all times. Um, do you agree with Dr. Wokola that maybe because the people who are running do not necessarily, or have not necessarily led the country before in that capacity of maybe a military administrator, or is it that because maybe now Nigerians are a bit more aware politically? What, what do you think the, th the case is? Well, I, I think it's very much expected. I mean, we have an election where the incumbent is not returning. So in such elections, it's usually um, a tough battle because new faces are coming on board. So as expected, uh, I mean, in 2015, we didn't have it like, and say in 2019, we didn't have it like this. We had it tough also in 2015, but 2019, because we had a president who could run for another term. But now you're having new guys on the block and they have to give it everything to try to persuade the, the voter to give their votes to them. So we've seen a very, very interesting campaign season uh, with, I mean, some of them turned into entertainment memes. Um, I mean, some of the funniest uh, promises, I mean, some of the elephants in the room addressed, um, a lot of tearing down ethnic lines, a lot of tearing down religious lines, everyone trying to push the card they believe will get them the vote and the sympathy of the voter. Now, is this going to work out well for the electorate? So uh, we have just few days to know how well they've done. I've, I've also been, I mean, excited to see uh, debates between the supporters of each political candidate. And these debates have been very, very passionate. Um, I mean, from in 2015, for instance, when President Muhammad Buhari was contesting, the drive, a lot of the drive was towards, oh, vote him in because he's got a military background, like you said, and because a lot of corruption um, had gone on under the Jonathan administration. Oh, everyone thought, oh, this is a general who would bring in the change and be firm on anti-corruption drive. Now, we've seen what the past eight years have been. We've seen the economic slide. We've seen the improvement in infrastructure. But we've seen basically a lot of economic downturns. And now Nigerians with a hunger, with a high, high increased uh, population uh, living on the multidimensional poverty, the NBS says that number is 133 million. Uh, Nigerians are voting with hunger and with anger. Uh, the economic policies of the recent weeks have also not helped. Um, so, I mean, and it appears as if the APC is also divided, um, I mean, between itself. The PDP is playing a card, you know, throwing in the northern, the northern, uh, the, the northern card, uh, the ethnic line. I mean, the, my Nigerians are torn in the very clear lines in these elections, and whoever wins, I believe, is going to be by a very slight margin. Well, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, the fact that you're saying, I mean, yes, the MBS has said that the situation, the, the poverty and the hunger situation is, di you know, is dire. But we have also been here before. It always seems like the, the weaponizing of poverty or, you know, the stress levels are increased and it's like the furnace is being opened upon us uh, just before the election. So, but it, it never really changes the pattern of voting. So, what what what, re, what real change or shifts is going to happen? Because this seems like some place we've been before. Might not be exactly, but it's similar. 
similar, but the, the, the different thing here is that you have, for the first time in, I mean, since 1999, a presidential candidate from the Southeast. Now, that totally shook the balance because we've not had a president, president from the Southeast since 1999. So here comes, oh, people who had said, oh, we want Biafra, we want away from Nigeria because we feel marginalized. They now have a face representing uh, where they're from. So that totally changes everything because you see people from the South, the Southeast finally say, oh, we've got a representative. Um, instead of channeling our anger into agitations for Biafra, let's channel our agitations into getting someone who's like us into the presidential office who they believe uh, might uh, bring the change and the development they need in the Southeast. Now, Nigerians, I mean, people would say that people usually deserve the government they get because they come from us. And essentially, the, the, the unfortunate depth of, uh, of corruption comes even from the lower cadre of Nigerians. So um, the weaponization of poverty is unfortunately still a handy tool in the hands of our politicians. You, I mean, why would anybody offer you a loaf of bread for your vote? Why would anybody offer you 5,000 naira or 10,000 naira for your vote? It's insulting to say the least. Um, and if Nigerians, more Nigerians are moved out of poverty, then politicians will now have to do beyond just campaigning based on words and flattery, uh, flowery words, and now bend down and actually do the work. I mean, most Nigerians after could just come out during the voting cycle. <clears throat> Thereafter, they, they, they go back to wherever they're coming from. No accountability. So, I mean, is anything going to change after this election? We're all just going to have to wait and see. Mm. Interesting. Achike, let, let me pick, up, pick it up from where, where Mimo has stopped. Um, some of the fears and concerns that the average Nigerians average within Nigerian. and without the country have is the fact that there has been a continuous flouting of court orders under this administration from 2015 to where we are today. And most recently, we've seen also INEC and uh, you know the courts in this imbroglio of placeholders um, and this is detailed for the governor of cross river the former governor of Akwaibom state goswell Akwabio, and of course the senate president whose case just recently um, was announced by the supreme court now this of course puts INEC in a precarious situation which calls to question of course the most important thing how free fair and credible our elections will be in 2023 how do you, how do, where do we even begin to address this concern for the average voter who is being told to get their PBC and now that they've gotten the PBC to come out and vote, how will they be certain that their vote will count? Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I think um, your intervention is a little bit uh, confusing. On one hand, you're talking about uh, the courts and the uh, the orders of the court that are being flouted, especially by this administration. And then, you know, we're also linking it up uh, with uh, the credibility of the elections and whether the vote will count. Are you talking about uh, the interference of uh, the court uh, with uh, the political process? Because, I mean, if that is the case, of course, it is a cause uh, for concern. Uh, but again, um, uh, you know, under normal circumstances that uh, we have seen the Nigerians weighing on behalf of the courts, you know, trying to insist on the uh, the independence of uh, the judiciary and all that. But, uh, you know, over time, we have also seen a lot of Nigerians have not exactly been in love with the rulings that have been coming out of the, you know, court. They say respect begets respect. So you have a court that is uh, involved in the, you know, um, uh, giving out all kinds of uh, orders. Sometimes when you have even uh, uh, judgments that have been given by courts of coordinated uh, jurisdiction, you will, you will think that, uh, you know, uh, the courts should also be aware of that, but you, they just get in and they give all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, uh, ruling. And so that, in a way, has uh, created a lot of anxiety. For long, have people been talking about the need to take uh, electoral matters away from the hands of uh, the judiciary. Because you now have instances where it is the judiciary that it is uh, cast the deciding vote on who becomes president or who becomes a senator or governor, you know, or any other position that is uh, being vied for in this country. And that is exceedingly very, very dangerous because you cannot ultimately at the end of the day uh, say that you're talking about democracy when you realize that uh, when it's a, it's a no tourism, that um, uh, it is the polling uh, booth that decides who becomes what in this country, the electoral process. So it is um, a, a thing of a great uh, concern. 
Uh, obviously, INEC has a lot of constraints, at the security issues and so many, so many other uh, issues. There are some that are within the purview of INEC to resolve, and they have tried to do some things in that direction. But a lot of us are not happy uh, with uh, what uh, with the the, um, the the outcome of uh, the uh, voters um, of uh, the collection of a uh, PVC cards exercise organized by the INEC because ultimately at the end of the day, millions of people were disenfranchised, not because they were not interested in the process. People who had gone to the poly, different polling units across the country three, four, five, six times to collect their PVCs, they did not collect. I think that is shameful. And uh, it, it, there is no way one to, so to a large extent will not blame INEC you know, for failure in that direction. But INEC has been able to get a lot of things right. But you know, they say that it is the sweetness of the pudding that determines you know, uh, it is a testing of the pudding that determines the sweetness. Yeah. So it is only when we have gone into the, this election and we have come out of this election, if we go in and come out smelling sweet, smelling like roses, okay. then we know that uh, INEC has done you know, an incredible job in the midst of so many, uh, you know, contradictions. Uh, Achike, I know that um, I think last week, Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken, I had a conversation with somebody who was speaking on behalf of CSOs in the country. Uh, they had put out a petition um, against INIC saying that they want a review of the PVC collection prior to elections because they feel that they've gotten so many complaints. And I'm talking about um, Enough is Enough and several other people in that memo. Um, who have said they've gotten a lot of responses from Nigerians who said INEC had told, given them a certain date to come get their PVCs and they were unable to get those PVCs on showing up to INEC offices. And, and that's something that you raised. Again, there are those who have also complained about the fact that when they went, they couldn't find their PVCs, but certain persons uh, from different political parties showed up at their homes with those same PVCs asking them who they would vote for. Um, before giving them those PVCs. So the big question again is, who's handing out these PVCs when INEC has said you cannot get a third party to receive your PVC, but then these PVCs are ending up in the hands of people who are so-called representatives of political parties. I know that we're a few days away from elections, but should we not be talking about this and maybe shouting about it on the rooftop? No, 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 no you, see, you see, when the INEC chairman, I think, I made that statement at Chatham House in the United Kingdom, uh, that there will be no proxy collection of, uh, you know, put on the PVC card. Some of us smiled and laughed because we knew it was already going on. And we had mentioned it to INEC that this was already going on. So we're not surprised about um, exactly, you know, what happened, people turning up at people's houses with their PVCs, asking them who they are going to, going to vote for before they give out uh, these uh, PVCs. Obviously, uh, you know, um, uh, part of the weakness of INEC is in the staff recruited by the INEC. And we must also understand how this is able to happen. Uh, INEC, these people are part of us. They are from, you know, from our society. And so you find a situation where INEC, for instance, does an advertorial about, uh, you know, the need for ad hoc staff. So all manners of people apply. The politicians are waiting for such opportunities. So they get their members to apply, uh, you know, to the INEC and they are accepted by, by uh, you know, INEC. And so you find a situation where you have moles, even within the INEC, uh, working or fifth columnists, if you want to call them that, working on behalf of uh, the politicians. So there's really nothing INEC can do to, to stop that completely. But INEC can try to put very rigorous processes, you know, in place to make it difficult for them to do whatever they want to do to undermine the process. For instance, look at what happened in, in Oshun. Why some of us at the, I mean, at the early stage, you know, had uh, praised INEC for doing such a wonderful job. And then, you know, you see what happened, series of, series of overvoting in as much as 700, you know, polling units. And then, uh, um, you, you, you know, and, and obviously some of these people, it's very possible that many of them are also partisans. Some of the ad hoc staff of, of INEC are partisan, recruited under the same circumstance, you know, I had I mentioned to you. And then the fact that um, even INEC itself, you know, I, 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 I acknowledge that there was overvoting in six polling units. If there was overvoting in six polling units, the, 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 there is, the, I mean, the, 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 uh, there's the, the, the INEC ruling or you know recommendation is very clear. When you have over voting, you cancel the, the votes in that polling unit and then do the election another time. That was not done. Why was it not done? 
perhaps because they are most working within the INEC. So these are some of the issues. You're always going to have this, this people there. But the only way I think we can challenge that is to ensure, you know, that the INEC are doing about that, is to ensure that they put in processes that are very rigorous that will make it very difficult for these people to do what they have done so far. There's been a mock, there's been a mock, um, you know, election, mock voting. Einek, you know, complained about the fact that not a lot of people showed up to test these machines, to test the, cap uh, the capabilities of INEC to run these elections in it, that's going to happen uh, over the weekend next week. Um, I I'm guessing maybe a lot of people didn't get the memo to show up for, you know, that process. But in looking at the beavers and the introduction of technology, which is another concern, because um, at some point, INEC raised an alarm that their systems may be vulnerable to hacking. And just as we know that this election is very keenly contested, and for once uh, in our country's life, uh, we've not, we're not able to say this is the person that we think is going to be the winner of this election, because sometimes it's very easy to know where everybody's, you know, vote everybody's going to vote but then it's more um you know it's wider than we always always expect it to be so i'm wondering um with the issue of the beavers and the introduction of technology and the concerns that people have raised about you know this beavers not necessarily being a game changer uh, are there other things that people should be worried about or should we all just you know be certain that when we go out to to the elections on saturday that everything would be fine and dandy and would not really have to worry about um Anybody yeah, trying to hack? Yeah, yeah well, yeah, well, he who makes cannot make. I mean, human hands made the beavers technology, and I think I guess they also had the capacity to make it. But you see, interestingly enough, uh, we were I was in Abuja with some other CSOs sometime last week, uh, where we had I think it was um, a, a you know a sitting of uh, the National Assembly Committee on uh, INEC and electoral matters, and they're uh, part of. And then, you know, part of the discussion was the issue of uh, the security and the vulnerability of the beavers. And then the INEC was taken up on that. We had a lot of civil society organizations, security people, members of National Assembly, and, and the media. And so the, uh, somebody, you know, kept, took INEC up on that. And then the woman came, the, a very high ranking official of uh, INEC, you know, came to defend uh, the beavers and said that so far, uh, it, uh, there has not been any serious attempt to undermine the beavers because she said that they bring in from time to time very good ethical uh, um, okay. uh, hackers. They just bring them in to try to tell them to break into the system, into the beavers, you know, and then they do everything they can. And so far, it has been impregnable, you know. And what, why? The reason, of course, obviously, is because they are going to get people, half people from outside, trying to break into the beavers. That's why they bring in these ethical hackers. So, so far, so good on the basis of at least of what she has told us. And so, I, 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 I do not think that uh, we should be too much worried about uh, the beavers. I think the beavers will hold true. The mock accreditation exercise has actually shown us that um, i mean the, the, the turnout the turnaround was very good you know you do it in, in two ways either you use your you know fingerprint or you use your uh, facials and the facials worked so well in fact in, in many of the reports we got to over the country was it worked so well worked so fast you know better than the 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 the, the, the fingerprint which which is also you know a good thing but i think that what people should be worried about essentially is maybe the issue of security the security forces have given us all assurances about the, the the fact that they believe they can protect Nigerians. I don't think they can protect Nigerians, you know, um, uh, relatively. If they, yeah. they could do that, they would have done that all over. I mean, uh, over the over the years, we have seen an increase in the level of insecurity in the country, especially in the lead up to this election. You know, simply because the politicians have also joined the bandits and the terrorists and the kidnappers to cause to try to destabilize the system. You know, but one thing I would tell Nigerians really is that this is our country. Somewhere along the line, we have to make a, make a stand for this country. The terrorists or the bad actors do not have the capacity to disrupt on a wide scale at the conduct of these elections. And that is why, you know, so you are going to have pockets of, you know, incidences here and there, but not near enough to cause any panic okay. in the general, you know, uh, in the country in general. Okay. Well, we're still talking about concerns and, of course, uh, paving the way for the elections next week, Saturday. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we still have Wemima Adeoni at Chike Chude and Dr. Ndubisi Mokolo. Stay with us.
It's still plus politics and we are looking at the road to the 2023 elections, which is just a few days away from today. And still joining me in the studio this evening is Wemi Adeoni, uh, a media strategist and a communication expert. We also are being joined by Chike Chude. He's a public affairs analyst and Dr. Ndu Mwokolo. He is a partner and chief executive of Next Year SPD. Uh, I'm going to come back to you, Dr. Ndu. Um, Let's talk about the issue of pre-election violence. It's happened on a very huge scale this time. Mr. President was not left out of it. His, his aircraft was pelted. Uh, we saw the presidential candidates of the PDP also um, uh, narrowly escaping some people who tried to attack him. We've seen attacks on the Labour Party members um, while they were here in Lagos recently, um, over last weekend, um, for their, um, I think it was their... Um, campaign in, uh, here in Lagos. We've seen several others. I mean, we saw what happened in Zamfara, in Kaduna State. I, I mean, the list is endless and it keeps on happening. Now, all we hear half the time is um, government saying, talking tough, or security agencies saying they're on top of the matter. But that's mostly the end of it. And this seems to be a recurrence. Now, let's look at the Kenyan example. Um, a lot of people were afraid for the Kenyan elections that happened just, um, you know, last year. But one of the most notable things that took place in the Kenyan elections, or that was observed during the Kenyan elections, is that the violence or the spate of violence was almost at its lowest ebb. What, what should Nigeria be learning from the likes of Kenya? And what sh are they doing that we're not even trying to do? So a couple of things. First, Kenya has learned from the last violence that marred the election uh, between Maya Kubiki and uh, the, 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 the last the previous president. So I think they learned from that. Now, what we're seeing in Nigeria is, is, is quite interesting to understand. First, for you to be able to look at the pre-election violence in Nigeria, um, you, you have to look, look at each particular one from a very different dynamics and to be able to understand it. And most importantly, you might look at it from single each out, each one out, either based on the state where it happened, to be able to build a scenario and then you can understand it. So that of Mr. President, what he experienced in that, either in Katsina or somewhere in the north, we could understand that to mean the people reacting against his government or against the Nigerian state. That you can easily link to issues of economic issues facing the country and all that. That we understand. If we take that, that of Lagos State, which we experienced, now there are two ways to look at it. You, you can look at it from 2019 to now. And to understand it is to understand it from an angle of a political party that has been in power in a state and is gradually losing power. Now, what a lot of people don't always look at very well is to know that the dynamics and demography of election in Nigeria is changing. It's changing that you no longer could say who had lately say that a political party, one political party, is holding sway to a particular place for a very long time. I tell people that the next eight years, people who are normally will be considered as non-indigenous will start winning local government chairmen in major cities in the country. Why? Immediately we start having a lot of young people start voting. The dynamics will start changing because most young people, especially educated young people, will vote for who they think will, will, will kind of promote their interest in terms of good governance and all that and all that. We have pretty do all that. So that is what you, 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 you saw in Lagos, where the powers that be are gradually losing powers to other, other political parties and they are fighting back. That's what you experienced in Lagos. Now, if you look at places like Zamfara, like, um, say, Burunu, what is it equal for us to build a scenario that wherever you have 
two political parties that are strong, strong in the sense that they are contesting violence will continue to come up. Why? Because no one party dominates the other. So if you flip it to what you see in Lagos, you never experienced this kind of violence in Lagos between 2019, no, 1999, 2003, 2007, because then AD was a very strong political party in the state. So now that you have other political parties making in inroad into the state and they see themselves struggling to hold on to their supporters, they are fighting back. So why didn't they fight back 10 years ago or 15 years ago? Because they were the dominant political party. So if you go to a state where you have two dominant political parties with their powers to swear supporters this way or that way, you will continue to experience those kind of pre-election violence. So that's what you see in Zamfara. In Zamfara State, the governor didn't win the election, but he got, you know, he got declared the, the, the governor of the state because of um issue that APC Technicalities, had. we call it. So he moved over to PDP, then he was able to change to APC. Now, remember, this, some elements in APC or some elements in PDP who were not happy with him came together to form a block. So you see him fighting back those old blocks in the PDP. So that's what you see. So the pre-election violence we, we, you, we are experiencing now are occurring in states where powers are almost like matching each other. Okay. But where you have a dominant political party in a state, the, the pre-election um, violence are very low, especially where they are they, they don't need to fight anything because they know what whichever thing they are going to win. Hmm. So that's that's what we're experiencing in most of these states. Just one quick question because I have to go to Wemimo and Achiki. Um, if you can answer this quickly, if these if this this these things you're saying is anything to go by, and uh, you're saying that these might be somewhat state sponsored violence, if our security agencies, just like Achiki said before we went on the break, that he's not sure, he doesn't have hope that the police can actually secure us on election day. That calls to question a lot of things. Now, if this violence is holding sway in so many states and it's somewhat uh, reportedly state violence and our security agencies cannot put people in line, what should we be expecting on election day? And, and really, because I heard somebody say today that, I think it was you who said today that, oh, people need to come together in groups and go voting, that if we come out in our numbers, uh, the people who want to, you know, somewhat rain violence on us might not be able to do that um is that not something we should okay, really worry so let about me, let me let me quickly let me quickly uh, make a correction these are not state sponsored violence they're they not so a state sponsored violence is even different from a government sponsored violence hmm. so these are okay let me not go into that but for this particular thing these are political parties that are in power trying to use not even the apparatus of the state, because most times they won't be using the police or the army. But what we know is that this, the police and the army are either inefficient or non-effective. So the, these are quite different. So what you're seeing are uh, either a dominant political party in a state, either because they are in power trying to lord over the other political parties. They are not state-sponsored violence. They are they, definitely they are not. So, should, so that's what you're experiencing. Should we be, so should we be banking on some of these cases, agencies? what you will see. Should we be banking okay, so on what security see agencies? Some of these things is that the, the police will try as much as possible, but because either because of manpower or other other form of inefficiency, they won't be able to match up to that level that we want them. Okay. Uh well, let me come to you. Um um, I think SP um, Hunde today, this evening, just tweeted that the few vehicles that they had um, that they, they used in emergency responses when there were issues have been burned down by angry protesters, um, cars that they were managing. So now they are unable to respond to any emergencies whatsoever. And this got a lot of backlash. Just picking up from where uh, the, doc the doctor stopped, 
should we be putting our hope and our trust in our security agencies? And this is not in any way saying that we should not trust security agencies, but with what is happening and what's on the ground now, and even the police spokesperson in Lagos saying that, oh, well, we may not be able to come to your aid because you burned down all our vehicles. Um, what's, what's, I mean, is there any hope whatsoever? I mean, let's start with the photo that attached that was attached to that tweet. It was a funny post of Sabinus. I mean, it appeared as if the um, was making a joke out of the situation. I mean, he's someone I speak to regularly, and I know he's up to his job. However, like Atika said um, earlier, do we have trust in our security agencies <clears throat> fighting? possible insecurity during elections, I totally doubt it. I doubt it because the work of security agencies in Nigeria is usually reactionary, which is totally wrong. You have an agency like the SSS. I mean, one of their duties is to anticipate and give government a heads up about possible security breaches. Have you heard anything about the DSS? The DSS, all of the police anticipate the violence that came after the economic policy of the old and new Naira swap. Did we anticipate that? Was there any nudge to say, oh, there's, there's a possible security breach here. This is what we have done. Most times, we, uh, our security agencies wait. I'm, I'm not talking just about the police. We've got the NSCDC, we've got the Nigerian Army, I mean, for internal security breaches and so on. Um, for elections, for instance, when a person like um, uh, Benjamin Hudain says, oh, now they burnt our two people that we're managing, what's that telling you? Uh, we mean, we're not able to help you. Some of the responses under that post, I mean, is what I'm going to speak to. And I, I believe the Nigerians, their responses were totally on point. I mean, first of all, when we had the answers, we saw a full force of security um, show up at, at the Lekki toll gate. Right here in Lagos, I mean, and you'd wonder where they all came up from. So if two bands have been burned, does that mean that in Lagos, for instance, there's no security cover for Lagosians. Does that mean that anything that comes, people have to, that you have to protect yourself? I mean, and one of the things I also see happening is because a lot of young people will be voting this time around. A big thanks to COVID-19 lockdown, to the NSAS protest, and to ASO strike, which made it able and possible for young persons to get registered and pick up their BBCs. Remember also the federal government has shut down universities, I mean, for the election. So we'll have more young persons who before now might not be interested in voting, showing up to vote. So we're going to see a lot of energy. Um, I anticipate, it's just my anticipation, that those who are planning violence might be matched. Their energies might be matched at the polling units. Mm. Because we're going to see people, where people are voting on the strength of anger, they're bringing the anger of the NSAS protest. They're bringing the anger of hunger. They're bringing the anger of poverty. They're bringing the anger of the most recent economic policy that's just apparent to be, I mean, I don't know what they're doing. They're also bringing the anger of seeing the Supreme Court, I mean, ruling on elections, and everyone is wondering what is going on. So I believe the Nigerians are showing up at the polls this time around, and they're going to stand with their votes. They're going to be their own securities. They're going to use their technology to live stream violence and to show the faces of those who... Uh, who, who bring those viol the, the, the violent acts to those, to those areas. So it's now left to a reactionary security forces to take it up after them. Mm. Let, let's, let's, since you brought up the issue of, um, you know, Supreme Courts, let's, let's delve quickly into um, the CBN policy. I, I would not necessarily call it policy because I'm still waiting to see the policy document that's backing this move by the governor of the CBN. Of course, he has, um, you know, raised a lot of eyebrows. Even polit certain politicians have thought that this particular move was um, targeted at them to make sure that they lose the election. But that's on the one hand. Um, if a, if a, a strategy like this or a policy as a, of this nature were to be put out at this time, one would think that uh, there should be maybe some study to see what the pros and the cons would be and how Nigerians would react. But then, of course, we are where we are today. And we've seen all that's happened in Ibadan, in, in Edo State, etc., etc. 
Let's look at what Mr. President had to say about this. I mean, he took the president all of these weeks to be able to speak on this issue. First, he told us to give him seven days, and then, of course, he addressed the nation. Now the president is talking about the fact that 200 naira is now a legal tender for the next 60 days. Um, how does this equal or amount to getting Nigerians out of the situation of the quagmire that we find ourselves in? Because, of course, the average person just needs his money. It's his money to eat. Okay, let me give you an example with myself. So today, I needed 200 Naira cash. I asked my neighbor for 200 Naira cash because I needed to pay for something that couldn't be transferred for. Just 200 Naira. He doesn't have 200 Naira. I swept all of my bags to find all the loose chain that I thought that I never thought I would ever need. My house is totally now bereft of any form of cash. Now, the the idea behind the reintroduction of new Naira notes or the redesign of the Naira, in my opinion, is a very good idea. I mean, uh, in, in, in all intents, I think it's a good idea, but badly implemented. But I'm saying badly Im implemented with my tongue in cheek because I'm also tempted to assume that this was pre-thought. I, I think that everything we see happening is exactly what they want to happen. Now, the president's statement, which I also read on Twitter, on his, uh, on his, on his page, also shows us that, he, I mean, the president has always known what is going on. I mean, he says he's giving an instruction out to the CBN to roll out uh, 200 naira notes. Does that tell us that the president had been the one instructing the CPN governor on what to do before this time? Does this point to the fact that the president is also, I mean, truly trying to make sure that there is reduced vote buying? I mean, and for a president who's got a candidate from his party also vying for this election, is the president against the presidential candidate of his own party in actions and not just in words? Because he posted uh, about last week that he's supporting the presidential candidate of the APC. But do his actions actually show? I mean, look at former elections. You find that the sitting uh, parties, they use the power and the might of the fact that they are in government to make sure that everything works well for their own candidates. But I don't see that happening in this instance. I see a president who has said that he wants free and fair elections. He wants people to vote, I mean, for whomever they want, and he wants their votes to count. It appears to me that the president is saying, again, by actions, more than in words, that he wants the people to choose their own leader and he does not want to influence that decision for them. Mm -hmm. I, I, I appreciate that. I also appreciate the fact that, I mean, the CBN says that we have a lot of cash in circulation, we need some back. Compared to other, other countries, like the US and the UK, Nigeria does not even have enough cash in circulation, in all truth. And I expect the CBN to know this. Um, and if you're mopping up cash, without bringing a corresponding amount of cash to match up, then it's, I believe it was deliberately done. Okay. Now, I, I think to so have a bite back, because now that there is no cash, if someone comes to the poll to buy your vote and offers you cash, people might be more tempted to accept it because now they need the cash. Look at the banks. People going out to queue up at CBN offices to, to swap their cash. They're sent back to the banks. The banks send them back to the CB, and people are going back and forth just to get their own monies. So this might have a backbite in uh, vote buying, in my opinion. Okay. Achike, I'm coming to you now. Um, she's saying it was a badly thought out plan, tongue in cheek. Um, some people say there was no plan. It was just directed at vote buying. Nobody thought about how this would turn out and how it would affect the common person. I'll take you to what the CBN governor talked about. He blamed the banks and politicians for hurting the same monies that he told us that they were trying to mop up because they didn't want it to get into the hands of politicians. So it makes the common person who needs this money to trade, especially the 200 or uh, the smaller de denominations, to wonder if this policy, so-called policy, really was not targeted at them because they're the ones who seem to be at the receiving end. Again, with all that's happened, how will this one way or the other drive the normal voter to come out and vote on election day? Because again, there's a tendency of people saying, ah, well, they don't care about us, so why should we vote? How ready do you think the average voter is for Saturday, February 25? Well, well, <laughs> any Nigerian that says, well, he doesn't care about it, um, it doesn't really matter, then let him continue to wallow in his suffering and in his uh, 
you know, difficulties. It's as simple as that. I don't think, I think we've gone beyond begging people to show interest in what happens in their country. You know, it's an act of irresponsibility, really. Uh, it, it, for, for, for people not to be concerned about what happens to them, not just now, but tomorrow, and what happens to their children. Uh, so it is, it's critical, uh, you know, you don't need to beg anybody where we are today. I, I mean, the crisis in the country is very, very obvious, and we all know that it is down to bad leadership and bad followership too. Yes, I would agree that uh, the CBN policy, uh, yeah, a lot of Nigerians will tell you, and, and I've had quite a lot of Nigerians call in and say, look, this is a good policy, but it is badly implemented. I do not think that uh, when the president gave his speech, he was talking about unintended consequences. I do not think it was, the, the target was the ordinary Nigerians that uh, they could be put in this situation where they have to start rioting from place to place and all that. I, I agree that it was politically motivated um, uh, for whatever reason. Of course, you can see one of the presidential candidates lampooning his own government, uh, 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 you know, that he has supported all this year, but somehow feels that uh, the government has taken on a policy that is aimed or targeted at him, and then he's fighting back. Um, you know, but again, uh, beyond that, again, I think the CBN too, because we, we, in as much as we are going to apportion blame, and there's a lot of blame to the, you know, uh, to be given, you know, uh, 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 to be put at the doorstep of uh, the CBN. But we must also remember that the CBN was not aware that it has been sleeping with the enemy. And the enemies are people who control the banking sector, the financial sector, the banks. Uh, they did, I'm sure the CBN did not reckon with the kind of rot that is in this country, where Nigerians themselves are also, uh, you know, up in arms against their fellow citizens. Uh, because what we have seen in the past uh, few days is man's inhumanity to man, where you have people outside queuing, they have no money to eat, they cannot buy bread and, and all that. And then you have you have these bankers uh, with plenty of money, what millions in their vault, refusing to bring it out for whatever reason. So on one hand, you have politicians that are trying to sabotage the effort because they are friends. Some of them own the bank. Some of them are directors of the banks. Some of them are friends to the people who own the banks and all that. Then you also have the ordinary bankers who also use this opportunity, who have used this opportunity to make profit. Ultimately, it is the ordinary people, you know, that that suffer, and that is exceedingly very unfortunate. Now, how is it going to affect uh, the turnout of voters? If the voters, like I said, they want to, uh, you know, uh, turn, turn, turn up, it's their concern. Is there, is, 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 I mean, the concerns, they, they will pay the price if they don't. But beyond that is the fact that a situation such as this, rather than do the opposite of keeping people at home, should be able to inflame them, you know, to great passion, to want to come out to punish the people or to teach the people who put them in this situation a lesson. That is, you know, it is said a, a hungry man is an angry man. Though people are beginning to say that maybe that proverb, you know, or that adage is not meant for Nigeria. Because we've seen great hunger in this country, great frustration. And we have not seen requisite anger that should back up the, you know, the, 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 you know, the suffering or the hunger that they are experiencing. So hopefully, and that's what I expect. You know, the politicians have put us in this situation and there must be a price to pay. Because if you look at what the ruling party is doing, the ruling party mobilized Nigerians along these lines, you know, to go against the party that it was. Uh, Achike, are you still there? Achike, can you hear me? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't think that we can hear Chike anymore. But well, I want to say thank you at this point, unfortunately. I want to say thank you. Wemi Maduni is a media strategy and communications expert. Chike Chide is a public affairs analyst. And Ndu Nwokolo is a partner and chief executive of Next Year SPD. It's been a very great and wholesome conversation tonight, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for being part of it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you, Thank you all for joining us tonight. Well, that's the show tonight. We will be back tomorrow uh, talking for development. And of course, as we gear up for the elections, don't forget the elections are very, very important and they do have consequences. Get ready to vote on Saturday, February 25. I am Mary Anna Cohn. Have a good evening.